Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming inside during this beautiful day. I just can't resist spending a couple of minutes introducing my colleague, uh, Ernie Moniz. I am really happy to say that he is the best Department of Energy Secretary that the nation has ever seen. <laughs> and it's Thank really you. true. <laughs> and I, I really like Sue, you know, she's terrific. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't practice this, I promise you. Uh, let me just tell you a, a few words about him. He is a particle physicist from Fall River, Massachusetts. I just spent 35 years in Massachusetts, so I kind of think of him as a home, homie. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, he, he came from immigrant parents from the Azores. This will have a theme in just a moment. Uh, after uh, a, an academic career, Ernie has spent a, a lot of time both e as a scholar as someone who's been involved in a number of non-governmental organizations, and then importantly in the federal government, where he served during two terms, uh, both in the Office of Science and Technology at the Department of Energy in, as an undersecretary, and then most recently as Secretary of Energy. So I say that he's the best DOE secretary because he's the whole package. He was, okay, you were the whole package. <laughs> I would still like to think of you as being there, so I'm gonna use the present tense, if you don't mind. Uh, he has incredible domain expertise in a, the variety of subject matters that come at the Energy Department. That's everything from high energy physics to solar power and uh, dealing with nuclear weapons. So he, he knows a variety of things, but probably most important, he also knows institutional processes and systems in which humans uh, interact, and that's incredibly important at the Department of Energy, which is in effect a holding company that includes both national security, uh, renewable energy, fossil energy, uh, basic science. And so Ernie brings all of that to bear. And uh, one of the things I admired about Ernie was that he was able to instill credibility and respect across both aisles when he served as secretary. That came across during the nomination hearings for Secretary Perry, how mm -hmm. much people admired Ernie and hoped that there would be continuation of his le le legacy. Now, no, most importantly, Ernie Moniz is the recipient of the Grand Cross of the Order <laughs> of Prince Henry from the Portuguese government. So that Azores connection, I'm sure it wasn't the only thing that was uh, to bear for that, but it's great to, to be part of uh, sitting here with Ernie. So let's begin. This session is called The Road from Paris, and Ernie was uh, critically involved in The Road to Paris. So I'd like to hear Ernie's thoughts about what it means to have had a little bit of a derailment off of the road, and what you think we can expect from uh, continued progress even on that road without the Trump administration's support. Okay, well thank you, Sue. Uh, certainly thank you for that completely over the top introduction. Uh, if I had known, I would have prepared one for you as well. Uh, but also, uh, let me also just add one note. Uh, since keeping track of all of those different DOE activities may be difficult, the way to remember it is it's the Department of Weapons and Windmills, Quarks and Quagmires. That's, that's the summary of the department. Now in terms of the road from Paris, first of all, let me, let me say what Paris was because I think everyone uh, naturally, uh, in thinking about Paris, thinks about the Paris Agreement, which by definition was the last day of the Paris meeting in, in, uh, in December 2015. Uh, but I also want to, rem to remind people that on the first day of the Paris meeting, uh, uh, a very important event happened as well, and that was when the leaders of 20 countries, uh, with Bill Gates there representing uh, 28 international uh, investors launched something called Mission Innovation. Uh, the, the idea was that these 20 countries, now, now it's grown, uh, would double the, uh, their governmental investments in clean energy innovation over a five-year period. The important point was the Paris Agreement said basically every country in the world, developed economies, emerging economies, much less developed economies, all understood the importance of pursuing a low carbon future and frankly took on 
you know, they're not mandatory, but took on uh, targets that are not so different among those classes of countries. A stark change from Kyoto in the, in the 90s. And secondly, that the innovation focus, for the first time, squarely put technology innovation at the center of the global solution. So those are both components that are important. That's the launching point now for what's happening now. Unfortunately, the, the administration has put forward statements and proposals uh, that uh, are counter to both of those threads, uh, uh, which is another form of dissonance that I'll come to. Uh, so first of all, of course, on June 1st, uh, the president announced the uh, beginning of the process to withdraw from Kyoto. Uh, that is a process that will go until November of 2020, but that's little consolation because uh, the idea is in the intervening period, the administration will do nothing to advance towards the goals, uh, even though technically we will still be in the agreement uh, until the end of the administration, almost the end of the administration. Uh, now, uh, I'll come back to the mitigating factors there, but let me say I think that that obviously, <laughs> I don't agree with that obviously, uh, and there are multiple shortcomings in my view uh, uh, with that. Uh, first, at a very high level, the, the announcement of withdrawal reinforces a pattern of, uh, of a lot of uncertainty being created uh, among our allies and friends in particular uh, with regard to the reliability of the United States in meeting its uh, obligations in supporting the institutions that we have spent 70 years building. Uh, that includes, you know, talk about NATO, talk about trade barriers. You go on and on and on uh, with, uh, with that. Secondly, leadership in the climate uh, uh, discussion or activities, uh, which of course means an awful lot to a lot of our allies and friends, was very hard won. Uh, and the United States uh, exercised that. And most critically, uh, I would argue, it was the joint announcement of President Obama and President Xi of China in uh, November of 2014 that was the turning point. That's what made Paris happen uh, and bring uh, every country along. The old excuse, China isn't doing anything, was blown away uh, in that, uh, in that joint, uh, joint announcement. Uh, now that leadership has been abdicated, uh, others, including China, have announced their intention of, of stepping forward. And, um, and I believe they will, and I believe Europe, especially Germany, uh, will. India has said the same. But frankly, without US leadership in these complex uh, activities, uh, there will certainly uh, not be a complete filling of that, of that role, I'm afraid. Third, the parallel activity I mentioned on innovation. So the administration put in a budget proposal to Congress that instead of taking that factor of two agreed to in Paris in the numerator, they put it in the denominator to divide the <laughs> innovation investments uh, by a factor of two. That is connected, in my view, to the strong statements made by China and Europe and India in terms of leadership, because we're not going back. We are going to a low carbon future. It's going to be a little bit rocky for a few years uh, uh, with our administration's actions, but we're not going back. Consequently, there is little doubt that there will be a multi-trillion dollar clean energy marketplace globally. That's a big market. If we want to A, withdraw from leadership and B, reduce our innovation investments, believe me, there are plenty ready to step in on that score and, and, get, and get market share. Well, so, would you talk about China in that regard? Yes. Uh, <laughs> let me add just one last thing. Yeah. And, and, the, uh, and this gets to, now to the dissonance in two, in two uh, respects. One is the dissonance that in withdrawing from Paris, many in the administration, Secretary Perry, Administrator Pruitt, have said kind of, look, the solution anyway is innovation. Dissonance with the budget request, cut by a factor of two. Secondly, Administrator Pruitt 
said immediately after the president's announcement, uh, the Supreme Court ruling holds on what is called the endangerment finding, that is that carbon dioxide must be regulated under the Clean Air Act. Nothing was offered, and again, a dissonance, I would say fundamentally with the science, uh, the science consensus. So I think on four counts, uh, this is the administration's actions of the last month have been uh, very, very uh, un uh, unhelpful is a uh, very mild way of saying it. So I have so many questions. Let me start with China then. Mm -hmm. That multi-trillion dollar marketplace is one in which you can imagine China going gangbusters to take advantage of that. And I am reminded of the theme of the new administration with regard to energy dominance. So how do those two things jive given that our clock might get cleaned if that's the right metaphor? Well, China is uh, making enormous investments in, in R&D, in clean energy. Uh, certainly, if the administration's proposal uh, were to go through Congress, which I don't believe it will, but if it were to go through Congress, within five years, we would have gone from by far the leader in these innovation investments to being significantly behind both China and the EU. Uh, that's the first point. Secondly, I want to emphasize China is not just investing in you know, renewable energy and nuclear energy, uh, carbon capture and sequestration. They are doing that. But in addition, they are making breathtaking investments in the underlying enabling technologies for the future. Uh, for example, the United States has been pretty unquestionably, and DOE has been the lead, in establishing our country as the leader in high performance computing. You look what China is doing right now, uh, it is incredible, including, by the way, recruiting back to China all those Chinese who got PhDs in the United States and were happily working in our universities and companies. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty now, a lot of uh, reverse brain drain, if you like, uh, going on there. So they are, they are uh, making impressive investments uh, 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 across the board. Now, in the United States, obviously, we do have a very vibrant private sector involved in, uh, in innovation, but the statements often made, um, I won't name names, uh, that somehow the government does not play a role in this are completely false. And uh, most in industry recognize that uh, of, of the federal investments having a very critical role in, in getting things going. A good example is now you mentioned energy, because you mentioned energy dominance. First of all, let me say, I don't know what energy dominance exactly means if it isn't the picture we already have in the United States, where I might say, I'm not, it just happens to be a time period the Obama administration, when natural gas production went through the roof, when oil production went through the roof, when deployment of wind and solar and cost reduction of wind and solar, not the, I guess went to, the, went to the basement in terms of the cost reduction, uh, et cetera. So this has been an incredible decade. Of, Sounds like of, it's of, making America great. Uh, 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 it preserved America's <laughs> greatness, uh, actually. Uh, so, uh, so that's really, really critical. But tying it back to the theme of federal investment, if you take the, and there are various views, but the fracking revolution uh, that led to the enormous increase in oil and natural gas production in the United States, the reality is the Department of Energy uh, in the late 70s, early 80s made the initial investments characteriz character characterizing these reservoirs, uh, supporting some of the technology development. Then it was picked up in the 80s and early 90s by a public-private partnership, Gas Research Institute, uh, in which uh, cost sharing was done to demonstrate the technologies. Um, uh, f frankly, a, a legend in this is a guy named George Mitchell. Mm -hmm. uh, Todd, his son, I know, is involved in the Ideas Festival today. Um, uh, uh, was a pioneer here, but it was a public-private partnership <laughs> with, at the same time, Congress putting forward in the 80s, during the Reagan administration, 
a time-limited tax credit to get things kicked off. And then, starting in the late 90s, things began to just rocket. It was always the government working with industry hand-in-hand hand, uh, and with Congress uh, to, to, to move things along. That's a story we can repeat over and over and over again, uh, and I'm happy to do that right now, if you'd like. Go. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so, for example, the last years uh, uh, at, uh, uh, at DOE, uh, a new program was established called ARPA-E, Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy, modeled after the, the legendary ARPA of the Department of Defense. Uh, and I won't, go, I won't say into why. Let me just say the track record is its first award was made in 2010. It's a, it's a young program. Uh, 56 companies have been established from uh, the awards made uh, in, that, in that program uh, in, a, in a mere seven years. Uh, $1.8 billion private follow-on capital invested uh, in, those, in those projects. I thought that's exactly what government was supposed to do, kind of get these things going, and the private sector decides which ones to pursue. Secretary Perry, early in March, made a completely appropriate tweet praising ARPA-E as exactly the kind of program we need to support. That was five days before the OMB put out a budget recommending that it be eliminated. Again, this dissonance is just incredible. But, sec but, but even more challenging in the discussions with those who feel government should kind of stay out of our way except for the objectives that we want. Um, we'll go into, we can go into that as well. Uh, the loan program. The loan, uh, DOE has a large loan program that was authorized uh, during the George W. Bush administration. Uh, it has similarly kick-started projects in the private sector that have, been, that have been picked up. But instead of focusing on how risk is shared between the public and private sectors, instead, shop-worn ideas uh, are applied. Oh, well, it's okay if government works only on basic research, but they shouldn't be involved at all in any kind of deployment activity. Regrettably, uh, I think there is not an evaluation going on what works, what doesn't work, what do we keep. It's a blunt instrument, and it will really harm our, uh, our innovation system. So let me actually just follow up on that. You mentioned the proposed elimination of ARPA-E, but in addition, the proposed budget would either eliminate or cut by half to two-thirds such programs as energy efficiency and renewables. Uh, programs at the Office of Electricity that make it so we've got a more vibrant grid so that all and, these smart things can go on. And resilient grid. A absolutely. Uh, additionally, the other energy programs would also be sliced. So what yeah. difference does it make? It was across the board. Uh, yes. nu <laughs> nuclear, fossil, I mean, you name it. Office all of, of Science. Office of Science, yes, uh, which is a, uh, a backbone. In fact, going back to the earlier, if I may put in a statement, to the very beginning of this discussion when all of these different missions of DOE were mentioned and you uh, ungraciously called it a holding company, uh, I, uh, I have to say that there is a thread. The thread that runs through all those missions is science and applying science to complex problems. Yeah. That's why we have a 17 national laboratory uh, system. Uh, DOE is fundamentally uh, a Department of Science yes. and Technology application. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so what was your question now? <laughs> I've forgotten. Well, what, what, what difference is it going to oh, make okay. that yeah. all of this R&D from quite basic mm -hmm. to commercial to deployment is, if it were sustained in the House and Senate, not only this year, but several years going forward? Right. And again, I say I, I, I'm fairly confident uh, There'll be some nicks, but it won't, it won't be this wholesale slaughter of these energy programs uh, when Congress acts. Uh, but nevertheless, if, if, we, if we do ask what, what would happen, uh, as I said earlier, uh, there are so many activities here in the energy business. It's very hard in the energy business uh, with large scale, the large scale uh, 
the large capital investments required, the large time scale, the strong regulatory uh, constraints. There is a lot of risk involved in developing these technologies to scale up. Frankly, we've seen that, uh, we're seeing that play out even as we speak here. Uh, those of you who have followed things like the Westinghouse bankruptcy uh, and uh, Toshiba's problems. Uh, on the nuclear on, on This, is, this yep. is on four new nuclear power plants being built. The trouble is, on the scale is, you know, you build two nuclear power plants in Georgia or South Carolina, which, which is happening, and you're talking on the order of $15 billion of capital. Uh, that's an, these are enormous investments. So there's all kinds of risk sharing that has to go on for the system to work, and in particular, to accelerate the deployment of the clean technologies in ways that we need to if we are to meet not only Paris goals, but the goals that we will need after Paris, after the Paris timeframe, uh, going to mid-century. So, so, so I just, it's just not gonna work, I think, without a, um, a strong public-private uh, uh, partnership. So there have been a lot of reports since the Trump administration announced it was gonna pull out of Paris. And those announcements have pointed to the fact that so many states are moving forward with their own clean energy agenda. So many cit cities uh, and county governments have made commitments to dramatically reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. And private businesses all around the country, probably some of the ones that you work with, have made commitments to zero carbon supply for the long term. So can we get there with that alone? So, uh, well, first of all, I, can we get there? We will get there. Um, uh, it, I think at some point we will see the federal government uh, re-engaging in this, um, however many years that may take. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, what you've said, Sue, is absolutely the basis of, the op of optimism that we're not gonna get deflected by too much, at least. Uh, and that's because you said, as you said, mayors, governors, businesses, universities, uh, all kinds of civil society organizations uh, have, uh, shall we say, risen up uh, following the announcement uh, to make clear that they are gonna stay on track. Uh, give some numbers, by the way, by my count, 22, 22 states have already made those statements. Uh, I've forgotten um, how many, many, many additional states, I've forgotten the number where, uh, in particular, the largest city in that state has made the similar commitment. 1,400 businesses have made that commitment. I think the issue is going to be how can the governors in particular the governors and the mayors, pick up some of the international leadership vacuum. It's not so simple, but I think it's possible. And some of you may have seen, just as, as a kind of a note on that, when uh, Governor Jerry Brown of California, and obviously California, is a, a, it's a huge economy, and B, it's a leader uh, in these areas. When Jerry Brown was in China, it's kind of unusual, President Xi, made a highly publicized, photographed one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one meeting uh, with, with Governor Brown, showing this idea of looking for leadership. And interestingly, the Paris Accord has a mechanism for non-governmental entities to uh, attach to it. Uh, so putting that on steroids will be one of the activities going on over these next uh, months. But I do want to focus on the business commitment. To me, that is the surest indicator that, uh, again, we're going where we said we were going. Business people have long since concluded, certainly post Paris, but even before Paris, that the handwriting's on the wall, that we're going to a low carbon economy. I remind people that a decade ago, the oil companies, many of the oil companies were using typically a $40 a ton of carbon dioxide shadow price in their capital allocation planning. That pretty much tells you <laughs> what, what they were planning for. Now today, utilities for example, once again, big capital decisions to make. 
they are not going to make those on the basis of a high carbon future. Uh, uh, you're not going to see new coal plants uh, being, uh, being, uh, being built. You might see some of the coal plants, the existing coal plants, run a little bit longer than they would have. So there will be consequences, uh, but, uh, but frankly, and something, Sue, you've been very strong on saying, a bit, the big change going on with coal and nuclear in this country really is cheap natural gas. That's really the basis of what's going on. It's a market phenomenon, not some climate policy, because indeed the climate policy for power plants, the clean power plan, which the administration said they're, going to, they're, going, they're not going to follow, and this, by the way, I believe, will, will come to pass. It will, not be, it will not be put into law. But it was only supposed to come into effect in 2022 to start blaming the loss of coal jobs, which have been occurring over the last 20 years <laughs> on the clean power plan, is ridiculous on the face of it. Makes me sad whenever I see uh, the, the coal miners from Appalachia standing up. The coal miners from Appalachia started losing their jobs when coal started moving to Wyoming mm -hmm. and Colorado in this neighborhood decades and decades ago. So, In fact, if I may just, <laughs> yeah. because this might be interesting, the people that, if you look at the number of coal miners per ton of coal produced in Appalachia, it's roughly eight times higher than in the West uh, because it's a whole different surface mining, highly mechanized, uh, and frankly, even that, even that giant machine scraping coal in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, 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 in, in Wyoming uh, is now becoming an automated vehicle so even that one job driving it uh, is, uh, is, is going. One of the things I think is interesting on a, a point that you made, which is many of the electric companies around the country who have been, uh, have had their electricity mix dominated by coal for many years, and, and especially by fossil fuel, moreover, have begun to make commitments about fully decarbonizing their electricity supply over mm -hmm. a number of decades. And one of the things that I think is interesting is that many of the studies of deeply decarbonizing the, the economy of the U.S. and the global community is to electrify many sources, many uses of electricity, both in industry, mm -hmm. in buildings that are now using natural gas, and in transportation sectors. So it's actually pretty interesting that the electricity companies not only want to decarbonize, but they've got a growth opportunity. And how how do we imagine that playing out between the, you know, the war of the titans uh, from the oil and other fossil companies and some of the electric companies in terms of market share going forward? Yeah, it's a, we are in a very dynamic period <laughs> in, this, in this sector. Uh, first of all, let me say again in terms of factoids that people might want to keep in their minds. Uh, at, at the beginning of the century, uh, this century, um, coal uh, was a bit more than half of our electricity supply. Gas was maybe 17, 18 percent uh, at that time. Last year, gas was 33 percent, coal 31 percent. So it's the first time in history that, that gas has surpassed uh, uh, coal, and the trend lines will uh, likely continue. Uh, and as, as was said earlier, uh, the main dynamic there is simply that natural gas is so abundant and so inexpensive. Uh, the, uh, and secondly, by the way, the, that market dynamic of gas replacing coal uh, is responsible for 60, 65% of the reduced carbon emissions in the United States. It's been that, that market-driven substitution which has accomplished that. Now, you mentioned deep decarbonization. Maybe it's worth saying a word about what that is. Uh, so the Paris, uh, the Paris Agreement targets of the United States and of others were typically a reduction of CO2 emissions in the 25, 30% range in the time frame of 2025 to 2030, you know, roughly speaking, the big bucket of, of commitments. And that's great. Uh, it is, uh, it's a, an important step, but it's a first step. Uh, because without continuing on that reduction trajectory, there is no chance of getting the kind of stabilization of temperatures uh, that, uh, that we aim for. And so um, what it means is that by mid-century, let's say, especially the developed economies, would have to be maybe 80% reduced. Uh, 
in, in carbon emissions. That's deep decarbonization. How do we get there? First of all, electricity is the sector that is most decarbonizable. <laughs> we have the most options uh, uh, there. And, uh, and so if we're going to have deep decarbonization, the electricity sector almost has to be close to totally zero carbon uh, on a mid-century uh, time frame. Now, when you look at other sectors, however, let's say transportation. God gave us gasoline, an incomparable transportation fuel, uh, very high energy density, uh, liquid, really liquid, <laughs> liquid. Uh, any of us here can go and pump it ourselves. You know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's really amazing. You have to overcome that. Uh, and so electrifying the transportation sector as much as possible has to be part of deep decarbonization. But in my view, there's no chance of, quotes, decarbonizing that sector. For one, and things like airplanes would be a good example of, it's hard to see a battery uh, flying a Dreamliner, uh, you know. Um, industry, maybe even more difficult. There are some major plants, which are big CO2 emitters, where you can imagine carbon capture, for example. But industry is very distributed, uh, much smaller sources. How are you going to do that? Buildings. Well, we're probably going to have to switch a lot to, ele to electrification of things like heating. Could be with heat pumps. It could be direct heating, uh, et cetera, which may be inefficient, but it doesn't matter on the emission scale if electricity is decarbonized. But you know, when I do my physicist's uh, back of the envelope uh, calculation about getting to deep decarbonization, with the technologies we see today and their extrapolation for a continued cost reduction, I got to tell you, I have a hard time getting beyond 50%. So I think that's where the, <laughs> the deep innovation agenda comes in. We need some big breakthroughs in areas that we don't currently see uh, if, uh, to get there. And that's why that innovation agenda today, because we're only talking 30 years away. And for this kind of innovation, getting it all the way from basic science to lab to pilot to, to, to commercial to scaling, that's a multi-decadal process. So we don't have a lot of time to waste. But that's the agenda. Uh, the good side of that, of course, is that's exactly the agenda that will capture an enormous share of that multi-trillion dollar market. That's where the jobs are, not in dreams of the past. I want to um, ask you to talk a little bit about something people have called the Holy Grail. It might not be the one that you're thinking of when you and I talked before, but I'm thinking of storage. Uh, for decades and decades, as long as uh, it's been since Thomas Edison started his little plant, electricity had to be produced exactly when it's used uh, because it's not storable for the most part. But there are some changes underway so that if you produced electricity from the sun during a sunny, sunny time of day, you could store it and use it later on. Or if you're producing electricity from wind, when the wind dies down, you could store it. Now, that storage, uh, there's a lot of work going on with, with storage that's quite precise. One second to another, you could store electricity and then inject it back into the system. But between seasons of the year, when it's really sunny and windy versus not sunny and windy, or peaks of the day that are off the charts, how do we think about storage and innovation and these decarbonization with technologies that right now aren't around the clock? And what's the outlook for storage? Well, okay, first of all, uh, the, the issues of cost reduction for battery storage, you know, it's much maligned, but I've always said it does follow a, a, uh, a Moore's law. You know, Moore's law is that semiconductors double their power every 18 months. Uh, 
The only difference is that the time constant is a century rather than 18 months for, for batteries uh, historically. But that's changed in the last years dramatically. So in reality, battery costs, advanced now the advanced battery costs have come down 70% uh, just in the last seven, eight years. Uh, and now you're seeing the, um, so I want, one, one part of this is I've already counted that into my vision for yes. the 50% yes. uh, that it's going to succeed. And if you look, what's happening, it's really impressive. Uh, uh, I would say right now, uh, utilities uh, can make long-term contracts, 20-year contracts, uh, for getting photovoltaic energy supplied with substantial battery storage for probably around nine cents per kilowatt hour without subsidy. Of course, they're, start, they're, they're doing contracts now with subsidy, so it's maybe half that, but that is an impressive uh, you know, march to, to lower, lower costs. So I think you know, that's why we're seeing a lot of storage coming in. In fact, those of you from California uh, in particular may remember um, a couple years ago there was the disaster at Aliso Canyon uh, this natural gas storage uh, uh, site, it's not functioning. But what happened was the two utilities down there put in almost 100 megawatts of battery storage, and they just got through a horrible hot spell uh, without any major problems, and that storage was a big, was a big part of it. Because otherwise they were relying on natural gas but they, to fuel Yeah, so the natural plants. gas out of that field was how they managed to, to, to do with peaks. So, so it's happening already. It's coming at us very, very fast. Uh, so certainly this kind of storage on the time scales of like within a day, uh, et cetera, I think we're not very far from having a major, major expansion of that, of that capacity. Now, if you get to seasonal storage, that's a much more difficult issue. Uh, the obvious one, which is in place today, but only geographically very selectively, is water storage, pumped water. So you, you know, when you got the, when you got the almost free juice, you pump water <laughs> high, and then it's up there for, for whenever you need it. Uh, but that's not going to be a, um, a broadly available uh, solution. I'm, if I, I'm not sure I have one. Now, another one that is talked about uh, in certain areas, um, which is much more difficult for me to imagine, but maybe it happens, people talk about heating up maybe a cubic kilometer of rock, um, uh, you know, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the summer and have it available for the winter, uh, so seasonal storage. So this is the message of deep innovation. We've got to try all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, uh, that has some possibility of, 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 of happening. So what's your favorite? Well, you know my favorite, my favorite Holy Grail. That, that to me, like, was like a mini Grail. I know. Uh, the, the full Holy Grail. That's why thing. he was the secretary. The, no, <laughs> uh, but I think an example of a, uh, uh, what would be a completely transformational uh, technology, uh, and it's done in the laboratory today, but nothing like the ability to scale it commercially and have it available at a reasonable cost, and that would be the conversion of carbon dioxide, so let's say we capture carbon dioxide from plants or possibly out of the air, but let's say from plants. You combine it with water and with sunlight and you produce a hydrocarbon fuel that you just use to replace gasoline. Um, uh, we have a DOE is a big program in that. Uh, it'll be decades if it works in a commercial sense but there, there, for example, come on, there's the answer to deep decarbonization. That alone could, could manage it. Electricity, efficiency, and drop in hydrocarbon fuels, basically done, right? But, you know, these are the kinds of long, really long shots. Uh, and we, gotta, we have to invest in, you know, five, six, ten of those long shots uh, and hope that a couple, couple pay out. I have a whole list of questions, and I'm going to ask one more before turning to you. And this one uh, occurred to me as I was listening to a conversation this morning about the combination of big data analytics, the technological revolution associated with 
institutions that set up platforms as opposed to providing a whole supply chain of things, mm -hmm. and crowdsourcing. So that reminds me of things that are going on in the electricity industry right now. Right mm -hmm. now, you can, uh, if you are a geek and interested in figuring out your own electricity supply, you can put on solar panels. You can have an electric vehicle that you plug in. You could sign up for the next wall system, which is a battery. You could put in a nest. Autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles. You could put in all sorts of gadgets to manage the electricity use and be pretty much autonomous. And you could do that in ways that supply to the grid or pull from the grid and essentially are crowdsourcing electricity supply. So how do you think of that? Is that a niche market going forward or do we really see transformations in this industry as in so many others? <laughs> I think this is very far from niche. Uh, uh, in fact, let me, let me uh, if I may, kind of take a little detour and then yeah. come back. Or if I don't, remind me to come back. Uh, you know, okay, I, I will make a, a, a crazy sounding statement that uh, maybe one of the biggest energy stories of the last couple of weeks is Amazon buys Whole Foods. Uh, now, what the hell is the connection of that to energy, right? But uh, what it says to me is it... Uh, it points out how the big IT companies, you know, Google buys thermostats, uh, smart thermostats, right? Uh, Amazon, uh, Apple does autonomous vehicles. You know, we go on and on. And uh, I think there's a real question uh, to what extent it's the large IT integration, which is underpinned by the technologies you said, including AI and big data analytics and cross-selling and everything else, is that going to be the future of every commodity? Uh, in the electricity sector, that development, that's why the Amazon buys Whole Foods is so, uh, <laughs> I think, so, so salient to the discussion. In the electricity sector, that, of course, at some point runs head on into the regulatory structure. Because in the, of course, in the electricity sector, historically, we had the most stodgy of all, you know, cost of service, regulatory structure, vertically integrated Monopoly. uh, utilities, monopolies, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, that's been, starting in the 90s especially, that's been changed with many parts of the country in particular with the so-called deregulation. But deregulation is not what people in other industries would call deregulation. Uh, uh, and so, for example, a major part of the action, I think, is going to be that whole internet of things, which in the home environment means all those gadgets with, you know, with addresses. That uh, you can talk to. That you can talk to. They, well, uh, actually, they're probably not going to be terribly interested in that. They want to talk to each other uh, and talk to the outside world. And tell them uh, all about you. <laughs> and exactly. Uh, and, and it's interesting. Right now, regulation could be viewed by the utilities as a safe harbor for their work in front of the meter. Protect us. Don't let those come, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, own what we do. But that safe harbor would keep you from behind the meter, which is where all that Internet of Things is going to happen. So I think that the business model in utilities and the regulatory model together have got to find some evolution in a world of big data. And, uh, and one other thing for the utilities, of course, is you know, business models tend to be stressed when the market isn't growing. And the electricity market is not growing. In some parts of the country, it's gone down. And of course, success in our efficiency and demand side management will only exacerbate that. So what is the business model I think it's got to be, if they're going to survive, it's got to be somehow to be in that competition with these uh, big data companies in terms of who owns that space. A few months ago, uh, I, don't, I don't think he's here, Tom Fanning, a good friend, he's, uh, he's the CEO of the Southern Company. They actually were a sponsor. They're a sponsor. No, yep. they, they are a sponsor. I don't think yep. Tom is here, but yep. they, they are a sponsor, correct. They have the little house out there with <laughs> microgrids and stuff. Uh, and actually, Southern Company 
is in a part of the country that is the most regulated. Uh, they have been very adventurous in, in technology and in R&D and all kinds of things, et cetera. But I was at a meeting with Tom in, in Atlanta a few months ago, and, um, and I said, uh, my summary of this last discussion was, I'm going to be very curious in 10 years to see whether Google works for Tom Fanning or Tom Fanning works for Google. Uh, he was less amused than the audience. <laughs> but, uh, the the uh, concept uh, of moving from a vertically integrated monopoly to a platform provider, as we've seen in so many other industries, yep. is kind of the and, topic. And, and providing new services. That's right. And providing cross-linked services. Uh, that's where we're going. And making sure that the grid remains right. resilient, able, and everything else. Right. And, and by the way, just as a last aside on that, and then I would couple that as well to the whole vision of a whole different city uh, built around autonomous transportation. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting couple of decades. It's an exciting time. Who has a question? Sir, would you introduce yourself too? Uh, and here comes a microphone to your left. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Lane from Washington, D.C. Uh, my question is um, automobiles. Uh, in the future, wh what is the future of gasoline use in automobiles? What percentage of automobiles will use gasoline, do you think, let's say 10, 20 years from now? Well, I'm not, I'm not. In, um, you know, cutting carbon percentage-wise. Well, again, so I'm not going to give a percentage, but let me say that, uh, first of all, in the United States and globally, as you know, uh, urbanization is the trend. And by 2050, I think the UN projection remains that uh, the world's population of nine and a half billion or whatever uh, will be 70% in, in, in urban environments. I believe those urban environments uh, uh, will be transformed in many ways by electric, electric vehicles and autonomous electric uh, vehicles with very, very different ownership models. Look, we're seeing it already today, right? Our kids, or in my case, maybe in a few years, my grandkids. My kids, uh, too. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they don't want to own. They, they want these different ownership models and, uh, and Uber versus taxis and you name it. So, so I think there's going to be an enormous market for um, an enormous deployment of light-duty vehicles uh, uh, in those urban environments. Uh, I find it harder to see that happening um, to that scale in the bigger, <laughs> bigger distance, heavier vehicles. Uh, um, uh, uh, although, even there, the extent to which something like trucking devolves much more into point-to-point -point, uh, travel, uh, which is now maybe 20%, I think, of the heavy trucking market, uh, that actually could go in the direction of these alternative approaches. If it's not electricity in terms of storage, it could be a fuel cell technology, uh, for example, where the refueling parts aren't so difficult if you have fleets and it's point to point. So I, I think there can be a big, a big transformation, but really heavy vehicles, certainly, again, I mentioned airplanes, some, uh, ma some marine uh, transportation, it's going to be hard to, I think, to displace those liquid, uh, liquid fuels. Maybe, okay. maybe my holy grail will replace them in a clean way, but, uh, but, and by the way, and of course it all hinges in terms of emissions on getting that zero carbon electricity yes. sector. Okay, I see a question here and then, okay, I want some diversity. There's one, uh, a non, a non um, wonderful diverse person. Next one here. I, <laughs> you mean I I'm a non-diverse person. <laughs> you're, um, you're, you are a diverse person. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jack Hayflick. I'm from New York City. I'm intrigued by the batteries. You see, that, that does it. New York there. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Washington, New York. Right. <laughs> Got it. Um, I'm intrigued by the uh, storage concept, storage of uh, electricity, use of batteries. My understanding is that most of the world's supply of the rare earths that are required for batteries are in areas of the world where it's politically difficult to, to get some of them out. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, so uh, there was a, uh, in particular, a flurry of activity, uh, I forget now, maybe it was close to a decade ago when China uh, 
uh, decided China was the major exporter of rare earths, and they decided to stop exporting. Uh, they were actually ticked off with Japan, as, as I recall at the time. Um, uh, that that has ended, and other sources have been developed, uh, which has got which has brought the costs uh, way uh, way down. But I think you know I think the thing you what you raise I think is a very important point, uh, and it's not only rare earths. We just saw an article on helium recently. Um, to what extent, for critical materials, are we going to rely on a uh, global market versus having at least some kind of strategic reserve. We have that for oil, uh, although in my view, very unwisely, this administration has proposed uh, to, in the end, reduce the petroleum reserve by almost a third. And we could go into that discussion as well. Uh, but I think the whole issue of strategic reserves of critical materials is one that's not been well thought through. On rare earths, uh, the Department of Energy did establish uh, about seven, eight years ago a, a center uh, at, at, at Iowa State University that looks at the issue of uh, recycle of those rare earths, so you know, make as much use of them as possible, uh, and very importantly, to look for substitutions of more common elements for critical applications. So that's the kind of R&D and innovation that's going on, uh, which can obviate uh, s some of the risks that you, you talk about. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Andrea Mitchell from Washington, DC. Um, let me ask you about another part of your tenure. Um, just two years ago, you were instrumental during marathon nuclear negotiations in Vienna. With you. Uh, well, I was an <laughs> observer. You were the, the key player. Uh, if the administration decides to uh, dismantle that aspect of the legacy as well, what are the implications? Can the deal or the central components of the regulatory structure, the IAEA monitoring, survive if the United States cancels its participation in a multilateral agreement such as this? Or does it collapse of its own weight because of the likely Iranian uh, geopolitical uh, mm -hmm. implications of that. Mm -hmm. And, and if you want to talk about, uh, as a <laughs> decades ago I was an energy correspondent, if you want to talk about the strategic petroleum reserve, uh, I invite you to discuss <laughs> the implications over the decades of it being used um, to affect prices rather than supply. It wouldn't be the first thing that was a strategic energy activity when you think about natural gas and the Ukraine. Correct. Lots of things. Right. Okay, so should I try to do Absolutely. the Iran, Iran question? Okay, so the Iran question, a little bit different from this subject, but uh, let me just say that if, uh, I think if the United States uh, were, to, were, were to withdraw, if you like, uh, from that agreement, uh, we would have uh, the worst of all worlds. Uh, uh, first of all, the idea that economic sanctions would be effectively restored is very hard to uh, hard, very hard to believe, uh, since the success of those sanctions, which did, in my view, play a major role in bringing Iran to the table, uh, could not have worked without international cooperation, and that cooperation was well beyond the the negotiating countries. It also included Japan and India, et cetera, all withholding payments from Iran uh, for oil deliveries and the like. Uh, so, that, so we will not have the economic leverage that we had before. Uh, in terms of what would happen in Iran, uh, it's a little bit of speculation, obviously, but uh, I have been, for one thing, encouraged by some Iranian steps with the Europeans in terms of joining forces in developing norms for like nuclear safety. So that is, they're acting as though for the longer term they want to be involved in the nuclear power business and have safety come in, et cetera, et cetera. However, what my guess, Andrea, is that what would happen is that uh, Iran would, in my guess, largely continue the nuclear restrictions placed on them to keep European, Russian, and Chinese cooperation. 
but I suspect they would back off from the unique verification measures that the agreement has, has in place. Because then the argument will be is, look, we're good citizens. The United States is not. And why should we do things now that nobody else in the world does? Why should we have 25 years of uranium supply chain surveillance, you know, et cetera, those things? And of course, it was exactly the extraordinary verification measures which made the agreement possible because nobody trusted Iran. And there's still, still a lot of mistrust. So anyway, so I think that's what I would guess would happen. Uh, we're much better off, certainly, uh, following this through. Clearly, we have a lot of other problems with Iran that we have to resolve separately uh, and with great pressure, Hezbollah, Syria, Yemen, missiles, human rights, uh, all of that. Uh, we got a lot of problems. But I also think, and this is something, okay, I'll say here that I'm planning to start also a project. Why don't we start looking, I mean, those of us in the, now in civil society, uh, start looking at Iran the day after. What do we want to see in 15 years? Let's assume the agreement, this agreement, does run its course uh, for the nuclear restrictions. Well, what do we want in 15 years? What do we want to continue to um, assure the international community that Iran is following a peaceful program in ways that make sense for the international proliferation, non-proliferation regime? Another um, reason why I'm glad that Ernie Moniz was secretary. <laughs> Question you over here. Spro, yes, the sir, spro, in the blue. Spro, but we, not, we won't do SPRO, okay? <laughs> No, she has Spro oh, also. Oh, I'm but, sorry. No, but it's right. Go ahead, talk about Spro. Well, That's so, okay. I, I'm gonna, I'll be very, very brief. Yeah, Spro is the uh, petroleum reserve. Uh, it is, um, uh, there's, there's, a, there's nearly 700 million barrels of oil in underground caverns in uh, Louisiana and Texas. Uh, this was established in the 1970s in response to the oil embargo. Uh, the, especially the first oil embargo uh, in, in 73. We do this in collaboration with uh, the other uh, uh, OECD countries. Formerly consumer countries. We're not, we're That's not right. Producer. Well, except we're still a consumer. We're still a big time net consumer, net, net, net importer. But everybody, including in Congress these days and the administration, they focus on a criterion for the petroleum reserve size that may have made sense in the 1970s and makes no sense today. Specifically, it says we should have 90 days of imports in the petroleum reserve. And today, because of our increased production, we have about 135 days in that, in that petroleum reserve. However, many of our institutions, including the petroleum reserve, still live in the 1970s, and the global oil market today looks nothing like the 1970s, nothing at all. It's hard to remember. There were no futures contracts. There was nothing. There, we didn't have the diversity of suppliers. Today, and this may get dangerously close to your uh, admonition about uh, prices, um, uh, but the reality is, Even with our increased production, we are and will always be linked to the global oil price. So a major oil disruption in the world, and you don't have to think too hard to see how some things going on in the Middle East uh, could lead to substantial uh, disruptions, could cause an enormous price spike that historically has always led to like 1% hits on GDP, big time hits on GDP. I think we need to have a robust, it's, it's an amortized cost, it's, we need to have a robust SPRO, I think, to manage those kinds of risks and with new authorities. But that's a, lo it's a longer story, but um, certainly I, I might say that in the last few years, the petroleum reserve has been used now four times, once 
for energy security, once for deficit reduction, once to build roads, and once to cure cancer. The, the Cures last Act. one's a the, surprise. The Cures Act. The Cures Act also sells oil for, um, for cancer research. Um, it's become a piggy bank without any concept of a modern view of energy security. All right, we have time for one more question, and it is the blue vest over there, because I promised. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bill Oberdorf, San Francisco. Uh, uh, as you have talked about, uh, what we've seen happen with natural gas supply in this country is, through technology and capital markets working has taken an energy source that was maybe 10 years to somewhere between 50 to 100 years. So we have this incredible abundance of a low carbon uh, resource, or relatively low carbon. How can we transform this into, if you think decarbonization it, through electric, electrification is the way to go, how do we do that? And it's probably the role of public sector, is it not? How do we upgrade our grids so that we can take nat gas from 33% to 70%? Well, first of all, 33% um, to 70% uh, would get you into carbon trouble. In principle, getting you to 60% uh, could, could lower carbon. Um, uh, but gas, look, gas is going to keep growing for a while. Uh, the gas re revolution, you said it, but let me say a couple, little bit more about it. The gas revolution has made this change in, in electricity production that we've already discussed, but it's made a lot of other very, very big changes also. Uh, it has been an enormous stimulus to manufacturing in the United States, um, and I don't mean just petrochemicals, because uh, the reality is that... Uh, a lot of industries need heat, and they're getting their heat a lot more cheaply today. There's been $185 billion invested in petrochemical plants, uh, largely in the Gulf, but also, also in, the, in the Midwest and, and, and Northeast. So it's been a complete game changer, uh, in, incredible. And that will continue. However, if I go to my deep decarbonization scenario. Gas substituting for coal will lower carbon. But even today, we are seeing an issue. Suppose 20,000 megawatts more of nuclear power shuts down in the next three years. And that is not an idle threat. I mean, this is, Could happen. there's about 20,000 more megawatts that are at risk. I would say, you agree with that kind of number? Uh, right, out, of, right. out of roughly 100. Uh, if those were replaced even by high efficiency natural gas, we would lose <laughs> about a third of all the progress we made in CO2 reductions. So that's just a, 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 a sign.